Good evening. Welcome to another edition of Weather or Not. I'm your host, Dennis Kulov, with forecaster David Guerrero. So David, we saw those pretty warm conditions on Wednesday impact the region. Do you see these conditions lingering as we head into Easter weekend and even into next week? Well, unfortunately, I think those conditions will take a little bit of a setback as we'll see more mild conditions for this weekend. But as you alluded to for next week, we're going to see a rebound in temperatures and potentially see 80 degree weather later in the next week. Oh, wow. 80 degrees. Sounds like we'll see an early taste of summer next week, according to your forecast. Anyway, we do have some interesting nature and news stories lined up for you this evening. David, what do you have to add? So my first story revolves around the discovery of capturing carbon and turning it into baking soda. Then my next story talks about the decrease in seagrass in Florida. So my two stories will be focusing on a severe weather outbreak that impacted portions of the Mississippi Valley on Friday, March the 1st. And then my second story, we'll be talking about the severe weather event that impacted portions of the Northeast in Mid-Atlantic on April 1st. Well, I think it's rather fitting that you're talking about severe weather because Connor Friedhoff has a feature talking about an outbreak that affected Pennsylvania in 1985. I believe that outbreak produced a few violent tornadoes in portions of the state. Anyway, let's jump into the first nature and news story. On Friday, March 31st, a high and severe weather outbreak struck much of the central United States, especially in the Mississippi Valley. A strong developing low pressure system over the northern plains worked in part with a favorable jet stream pattern to help to lead to such a widespread event. During the late morning hours, forecasters at the Storm Prediction Center released a bimodal high risk. The northern high risk zones included portions of Illinois, Iowa, and Missouri, while the southern high risk zone included portions of Arkansas, Tennessee, and Mississippi. The high risk is the fifth and highest risk that can be issued by the Storm Prediction Center and the first one to be issued since 2021. 87 million Americans were under some sort of risk, or roughly 25% of the U.S. population. At least 75 tornadoes have been confirmed by the National Weather Service and more were added to the total as the National Weather Service continues to survey the damage, including this image of twin tornadoes in Kyoto, Iowa. The strongest has been rated an EF4 which struck portions of Wapello and Johnson counties in Iowa and packed winds of 170 miles per hour. Outside of the tornadoes, there were a total of 440 wind reports and 328 hail reports, leading to the unfortunate verification of this high and severe weather outbreak. Scientists have developed a new technique that could help mitigate our issues regarding carbon emissions. The new technique developed in a study uses copper to modify the absorbent material used in existing carbon capture technology. This would result in a more efficient absorbent that can remove CO2 at a capacity two to three times greater than existing absorbents. Once captured, the carbon dioxide can, be, can then be turned into sodium bicarbonate, or commonly known as baking soda. With the inclusion of seawater, the sodium bicarbonate is then released into the ocean, which acts as an infinite sink for the gas. Despite its promise, there are regulatory and environmental concerns, such as the potential legal issues associated with releasing sodium bicarbonate into the ocean and the possibility of negative impacts on ocean life. However, government and international organizations are pushing for the release of this technology to address the ongoing climate crisis. As we opened up April, Mother Nature sure had a lot of tricks up her sleeve for the Northeast region. During the late morning hours on April 1st, the Storm Prediction Center issued a rather unusually large severe weather risk for much of Pennsylvania and New Jersey, signaling the threat for numerous severe thunderstorms. In the orange areas, an enhanced risk was issued, a level 3 out of 5 on the Storm Prediction Center scale. During the afternoon hours, a strong line of showers and storms moved through here locally as well. The Beaver Stadium Weather Stem Station recorded a gust of 68 miles per hour. With these strong thunderstorms and a combination of high winds outside of the thunderstorms, nearly 250,000 residents lost power across the state of Pennsylvania during the afternoon hours. As the line of storms moved eastward, they rapidly re-strengthened into portions of southeastern PA, New Jersey, and even Delaware. So far, eight tornadoes have been confirmed, with the strongest in EF3 in Bridgeville, Delaware, that came from a separate discrete supercell. Outside of the tornado threat, there were a total of, of at least 200 wind and hail reports from the severe weather risk zone. For this particular year, it seems like Mother Nature substituted the phrase March rolls in like a line with April instead of March. 
New surveys have shown that seagrass in Tampa and Sarasota Bay is rapidly declining despite areas meeting the state water quality targets, while pollution and red tides in the region have been identified as the key causes of the decline. Seagrass losses have been has also increased despite water quality targets being met. The die-off is a warning sign for the overall health of area waters, with scientists recommending action to prevent the seagrass ecosystem from collapsing. Ecosystems with seagrasses are important as they shelter and feed marine life, store carbon, and prevent erosion. Despite the current situation, scientists believe that the seagrass can bounce back if proper response is taken. The recent seagrass losses have underlined that a new approach may be necessary to keep up with the increasing strain on Florida's waters as population and development expand. Now, if you have any plans for this Easter weekend, they should be a go as pleasant conditions are among us. Now, as we saw that low pressure system affect us Thursday, head off towards the Atlantic. High pressure will then be introduced as temperatures will start to trend back for Friday as cooler air will be brought down. Areas south of Pennsylvania should see rain as a southerly low pressure system will linger there as well. But as for State College, we'll see a mix of sun and clouds for the rest of the day. And these conditions should persist into Saturday as mild and dry conditions will persist. The high pressure will then move north towards Canada, decreasing cloud cover from relatively mainly cloudy to partly cloudy. Areas affected from that southerly low should see precipitation for Saturday. So I'm sorry for those news. But for, Sat for, for Sunday, the mix of high pressure and low cl cloud cover should set up a beautiful day Sunday. Uh, if you have any plans for Easter, such as an Easter brunch or seeing your family or Easter egg hunts, should be a great day to do so. Now for Friday, we're going to see temperatures at 56 degrees, mainly cloudy, and the mild conditions are due to that cooler air being brought down from that high pressure. Friday night, temperatures will drop down to 33 degrees, partially clearing late, and this trend will continue on for Saturday as we'll see conditions be at partly cloudy conditions. Temperatures will be at 55 degrees. Then for Saturday night, it'll be relatively chilly as temperatures will be at 32 degrees. Then for Sunday, like I said, happy Easter to each and every one of you. Temperatures will be at 59 degrees. And I forgot to say this, if you, for the kids out there, the Easter bunny should not see any delays due to the weather. So I hope you get your Easter eggs filled with chocolates or whatever you ask for. Now, Connor Friedoff is going to take us back in time with a feature called Tornado Flashback. Stay tuned. On May 31, 1985, a series of tornadoes would wreak havoc in parts of Pennsylvania, Ohio, New York, and Ontario. Though tornadoes and small outbreaks can occur in the Mid-Atlantic, this outbreak was unlike all others to strike the region. In a single day span, 44 tornadoes would touch down, including 12 F3s, 7 F4s, and 1 F5. Note that this event occurred before the adoption of the enhanced Fujita scale, so the measurement parameters for damage differ than those used for today's tornadoes. What's perhaps most astonishing about this outbreak is that all instances of severe weather occurred within a 10-hour span. A low-pressure system in Minnesota quickly tracked eastward across the Great Lakes, bringing with it a robust cold front. This, along with ample moisture flowing in from the south, created a perfect storm of severe ingredients, all coming to a head around 2 p.m. Eastern that day. The focal point for many weather historians and Pennsylvania-based meteorologists remains the Niles Wheatland F5 tornado. To this day, it remains the only F5 slash EF5 tornado to spin within Pennsylvania state lines, and it was the only F5 reported in 1985 across the whole of the United States. Yeah, uh, May 31st, 1985, I was in graduate school. I was um, here in the Weather Center. We had an old radar set up and about where my office is now, and Greg Forbes was running the radar. And we were looking at multiple, it was just monochrome back then, but multiple hook echoes on that radar. It touched down near the Ravenna Arsenal in Ohio around 6.30 p.m. 
Quickly, it strengthened to near F4 capabilities, striking the town of Newton Falls. After passing Lordstown, the tornado reached F5 strength and wiped out many structures in the north of Niles, Ohio, including hundreds of homes and an entire shopping center. Winds in Niles were strong enough to move large petroleum storage tanks, each weighing, weighing roughly 40 tons, a considerable distance away from their bearings. Crossing the state line, the tornado once again reached F5 strength as it reached Wheatland, Pennsylvania. The half-mile-wide tornado completely eviscerated a steel-framed trucking plant, swiping nearly the entire building off its foundation. Around 95% of Wheatland's structures were destroyed in a scene that looked more akin to a war zone than a country town. The tornado would weaken slightly but later strike Hermitage, where it also struck the local airport. That's fantastic! It was, it was surreal. There were just so many of them. And um, the lightning outside our window was pretty impressive, but nothing happened here in State College that was worth remembering as far as I can tell. Um, but it was certainly uh, an interesting setup. Dry air in the mid-levels that we don't see in this part of the country very often. And um, they're pretty strong, <laughs> pretty strong tornadoes for sure. All in all, the, the Niles-Wheatland tornado was responsible for 18 deaths, over 300 injuries, and $750 billion in damages, over 50% of the total costs accrued in the outbreak. The whole of the outbreak saw 65 parish in Pennsylvania. Today, this remains a record for the deadliest tornado day in the Keystone State. As severe weather season is upon us, it's important to remember that tornadoes and even violent ones are not limited to the plains and the south. Many have touched down here, and many Pennsylvanians have lived to tell the tale. For whether or not, I'm Connor Freihoff. As temperatures start to scale back for this weekend, we're going to start a relatively long dry stretch. Starting on Friday, as temperatures will be at 56 degrees, high pressure will come in and we'll see mainly cloudy conditions for that day. Cloud cover will then decrease as the days go by, starting with Saturday with partly cloudy conditions. Setting up for beautiful conditions on Sunday, Easter Sunday, temperatures will be at 60 degrees. But as for next week, the fun won't stop there as we'll see dry conditions persist until the end of the week. Tuesday, Wednesday, and th Thursday should be partly cloudy. But the main story here is the temperatures, as temperatures will start to gradually increase as the days go by until Thursday and Friday, as we'll see abnormally high temperatures, as we'll see temperatures reach 80 degrees, which begs me to ask the question, is it April or is it May? Thank you for your extended forecast, David. I liked how you mentioned the 80 degree temperatures because that is related to our weather whiz quiz question of the week this week. So the question for this week states, when is the normal first 80 degree day of the year in State College? Is it A, April 10th? Is it B, April 17th? Is it C, April 26th? Or is it D, May 5th? If you guessed C, April 26th, you are in fact correct. You know, it's crazy, Dennis, because I remember a couple weeks ago, I mentioned winter-like conditions in my forecast. Now I'm talking about summer-like conditions. So I don't know if the seasons are confused this year or what. Sure as the seasons are confused this year, because I believe back in January, we had a prolonged period of spring-like conditions. And now it seems like we're having an early start to summer in the middle of April. Well, at least the early blooms are benefiting from these high temperatures. I'm excited to see the leaves bloom out and the flowers come out as well. So thank you for joining us for this evening's Weather or Not show. Stay tuned for next week for another jam-packed show.